On this episode, we talk about self-driving cars and two small German SUVs, the BMW X1 and the Mercedes-Benz GLC, next on Talking Cars. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Jake Fisher. I'm Gabe Shenhar. There's been a lot recently about self-driving cars, both at CES and at Detroit. And even just last week, uh, the Obama administration said that they wanted to spend $4 billion over the next 10 years researching self-driving cars. What's going on? Well, a lot of people are talking about self-driving cars, right? I mean, you see these, uh, the Google car going around, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, this... It's so adorable. Uh, auto uh, automotive dystopian future, <laughs> right? If, these little S golf carts. Yeah, some people, some people think it's, 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 the end of, it's the end of times. Other people think it will be great. Well, and the truth is, it's probably neither one of those. Because, I mean, Google's not really marketing this little golf cart. This is not what they're doing. It's about research. And, yeah, okay, fine. Self-driving cars, it's kind of inevitable. We might see that, you know. 20, 30 years in the future. But what's interesting about it is actually the technology that they're developing right now, and that is going to be available very soon. Um, Cadillac's talking about the CT6 later this year. You'll be able to take your hands off the wheel. And, you know, not like Tesla and others where you're mm -hmm. like, you're supposed to hold on to it. They're saying, yes, you could take your hands off the wheel. Mm -hmm. And there are situations where the car will drive itself. This stuff is coming, and it's good because it's going to help safety because the cars aren't going to get tired or bored or distracted and no it's not this terrible situation where we can't drive anymore it's like i, I still want to drive stick and all that stuff mm -hmm. i still want to but it's it's the times that are nobody wants to drive it's that long boring highway it's that that stop and go traffic that we're going to see some self-driving capability you're already in. seeing a lot of this especially on high-end production luxury cars it's going to be standard on the genesis g90 uh, we have it on our bmw 7 series obviously tesla's autopilot exactly i mean the ingredients of auto autonomous driving are already here I mean, the seeds are already there. The technology is, is getting uh, better and better. And uh, we're seeing it in those cars you mentioned. And uh, it has a huge potential. I mean, it's, most tra traffic accidents are caused by human error. And if the technology and, uh, and computers can eliminate or, or at least mit mit mitigate to some extent, uh, that, according to some researchers, uh, that can save about 25,000 lives a year, and that's uh, it's huge. No, that is huge. But the thing is, is that I think right now we have the ingredients, but we don't quite have the recipe. Because, I mean, you've seen with, uh, especially the Google car, you've, you've seen accidents with other normal cars, with, mm -hmm. with people driving them. You know, the, there is a lot to still be determined with the handoff between when is the car driving itself and when do I have to tell the driver to get back into the game. There's a lot of... Sure, we have all the bits and pieces and we can make it work in these limited situations, but driving is more complex than we give it credit well, for. Well, you know what? A lot of driving is not complex. Mm -hmm. So the 99% of driving, you know, the technology is here. It's already here. Right. The cars can handle it. It's the 1% that's really hard, and that's mm -hmm. going to take a really long time to get there. You know, my kid needs to go to soccer practice, and he could just go into the car, and the car will take him there. That's not going to happen. But we are going to get in a situation where you can take your hands off the wheel, and the car will be piloting itself sometimes, and then it'll let you know when it needs, it's, needs help, and you know, you'll engage again. Right, and I mean, that's a lot of what the um, four billion dollars, the proposed four billion dollars of government research is going to go towards. First of all, there has to be regulations about this stuff. You can't just let this sure. out in the world without sure. some sort of federal oversight. And they're trying to fast track that stuff. And in order to do that, you need research. Uh, it costs money to do human factors research. It costs money to, they also want to improve infrastructure, which this country really needs some improvements in infrastructure. And if we get it partly through automated cars, great. So, I mean, the research and the regulations have to come on the back end as well. They have to catch up with this. Yep. Now, look, it makes sense. It's a, it's a new technology. We're going towards this. It would make sense to, you know, invest and have America being the, in the forefront of this technology that is, you know, it, it's, it's not about the hardware anymore, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we know that. I mean, people have Android phones or, or, you know, iPhones that are made in China. It's not about the hardware. It's about the software that drives it. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to happen in the automotive industry going forward. Yeah, everywhere in the world, every automaker is busy perfecting these technologies. And, yeah, you need some some kind of an umbrella organization that will just have some uniform standards and so it's not open to 
each manufacturer's interpretation. Right now, could you, right, because you have a lot of companies throwing around some pretty big amounts of money. There's rumors of Ford working with Google. Uh, General Motors has spent, I think, $500 million to buy into Lyft, you know, with the idea of, of driverless right, cars right. driving people around for car sharing. But, but they're playing back, they're, they're, they're playing catch up. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I don't want to get too wonky here, but I mean, there's a company called Mobileye, which most people probably have mm -hmm. not heard of, and they actually drive the technology on 80, 90 percent of the vehicles that are doing this autonomous type uh, stuff. And so they're almost the sole supplier for all these technologies. <laughs> right, I mean, they're, they're probably best known for Subaru's EyeSight system. Right, but they're actually driving most of the cars out there. You mm -hmm. know, they're kind of like the Android to, you know, all the phones. Right. And uh, other people want to get in that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be a big game, and it does have, I mean, yes, we're driving enthusiasts. You know, there's certain times when we really want to mm -hmm. have a good driving car, but there's other times when just droning down the interstate, sure. uh, let, let the car do the work. Yep. Or when I'm tired, let the car do the work. And 95% of the population are, are pro probably not driving enthusiasts. And for them, driving has become a sort of a burden and a nuisance. And that uh, can really have some, some real benefits. Right, it can. Yeah. But for now, uh, we have normal cars that we have to drive ourselves. And we yay. have, yay. <laughs> Well, the cars behind us, one of them is yay, and one of them is nay. Yeah, nay. Yeah. What's behind us, Gabe? So, okay, we have a BMW X1 here, and we have a Mercedes GLC. Now, the, it's, it's, uh, it's important to say that these don't compete in the same Right, exactly. I was going to get into that. The X1 is a, kind of a compact luxury SUV, the second generation of the X1, which slots underneath the X3, of course, and quite a bit smaller and, and less expensive. And we have the uh, Mercedes GLC here, which is the uh, successor of the GLK, and uh, that is a competitor uh, to the X3, so uh, at least half a notch above it. But, what, what but, I, but, I mean, I, I just want to look at these cars. I mean, they look very similar in mm -hmm. profile to anyone who does not know what an X1 or a GLC is or think GLC is a You're right, Mazda anyone, anyone who doesn't know to slice apart the segments, no. right? Yeah, they look They have the same similar. profile, they have similar interior, they have similar exterior. The dimensions aren't that crazy off. No, and... Interior um, space is similar. But the lesson here is, it depends what you build a car on. Mm -hmm. where, what the underpinnings, what the platform is. Because the X1 isn't a traditional BMW. Is it? Well, and neither is, it, yes, it, it's not a traditional BMW because it's uh, based on a front wheel drive platform. It shares uh, its platform with the uh, larger minis, the Clubman and the, the, the upcoming next, ones. Uh, yeah. Countryman. Yeah, the brand new Clubman, the upcoming Countryman. Right. Yeah. So that means transverse engine and uh, a whole new uh, feel for a BMW. And that's kind of like killing a sacred cow for a BMW. It's not a rear wheel drive based uh, vehicle anymore. I mean, just to remind you, the uh, Mercedes did the same thing with the GLA, which is a direct competitor of the X1, and that's also a front-wheel drive platform. Yeah, the front-drive A-Class, right. which isn't sold which is, here. So well, I mean, so, sold as so, a CLA. So both yeah. uh, BMW and Mercedes kind of killed the sacred cow here. But that Mercedes, which does <coughs> compete in a class up, is based on the rear-drive C-Class. C-Class, yeah. yes, and that's, uh, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, let, let, let's break it down. It's a small car that's front drive that they put a different body on. And it's actually very similar to, say, you know, a Ford Escape or a Honda CRV. You know, that's what this is. And it's not a bad thing, but it's not something that you really want to sink 40 grand into. Well, I mean, you know, to it's, me, it's, well, 44 on that, sure. actually. But, you know, to be fair, this could be done correctly. I mean, we're not going to come out and say that all you know, SUVs based right. on front drive platforms are trash. No, and absolutely right. Um, it's, and how you, you, it's how you cook the pudding. Well, and it's kind, it's kind of like, you know, again, to the Mercedes-Benz GLA, or even more on point, the, uh, the CLA, the, mm -hmm. the, the little, the little Mercedes-Benz that's front wheel drive. Um, there are great front wheel drive cars. That's not one of them. No. And this is the big disappointment with the X1 for me, that the Ford Escape, yeah, it's front drive based, whatever. It drives really nice. Mm -hmm. This thing doesn't. No. Nope. You know, it's almost like they kind of like said, okay, we're going to make it off a small car. People aren't going to care. Yeah, we'll just give them whatever they get. It's really disappointing to me. Whereas the contrast is, you know, I just drove the, uh, the GLC the other night and wow, what a nice car. What, I mean, it feels like a, a BM, you know, Mercedes Benz. Yeah. It feels, you know, it's got that same steering feel, that same quietness, the same, you know, really advanced ride that you expect. So, I don't know, it seems like kind of a short-sighted move to me, to what they did with the X1. I think, though, the X1's ingenious. 
Well, the X1, uh, you know, <laughs> no, they, they, they'll mean, do it. I mean, there is an Audi Q3, there is a Mercedes <coughs> GLA. I mean, these are cars that are that deviate to some degree from their uh, their d natural DNA. I, I'm not and I don't think that they all do it the same. I think that right. uh, BMW mm -hmm. kind of found a, a little bit of a sweet spot here. The, the, well. the interior is, I mean, not that what Jake said doesn't have a grain of uh, truth in it, but it's a matter of degree. You know, the, the interior is just very BMW. The seats, the... Good, good showroom appeal. Right. And that's it. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's why I think uh, everyone's right. I mean, <laughs> We're all winners. We're all, everyone, every participation, participation <laughs> awards for everyone. No, I mean, the X1 has a ton of showroom appeal. I mean, it looks like an SUV. You sit up high in it. It has a nice interior. It's got the, it's got the Roundel badge on the hood. I mean... You know, we've had people ask us about X1s. It's a very tempting If you don't car. drive it, but, but this is so disappointing. Why can't a company like BMW get a front drive platform right here when they know how to do it? I mean, the minis are better. I mean, it's just, it's, it's disappointing. And you know what, look, I mean, let's, let's be, and, and Gabe, you're totally right. It doesn't matter what you put in, what, how you make it, okay? I don't care if it's electric steering. I don't care if it's a solid beam rear axle. If you could figure out how to tune it right so the thing drives well, mm -hmm. that's great. And they have not tuned that right. They the, have not The done steering that. is mediocre. It's, right. it's surprisingly loud inside. The ride yes. is nothing special. Right. Yeah, and that just makes the car feel like a letdown, especially at 44 grand. Right. And that car, you can't even get blind spot monitoring on it. That car does not have forward collision warning. I mean, it's... It's crazy expensive. I mean, not that yeah. German SUVs are any sort of great value. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll just to clarify the price point. I mean, the, the starting price is uh, somewhere in the mid 30s, but BMW likes to uh, pad charge the, for the paint and yeah, stuff exactly. with options. They so typically, want to equipped, charge for yeah, everything. You typically find them either at like 41,000 or 44,000. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and the big loop is that a lot of people are going to be leasing it, and that changes everything too. So. I mean, I'm not saying that GLC is a terrific value either. I mean, it's $49,000, but at least I have Ford Collision Warning, which is standard on all of them, which is something nice that Mercedes does that BMW should do someday. Um, but Mercedes is really cheap about heated steering wheel and BMW isn't. Well, the, the GLC's cut. <laughs> no, that's it's fair. It's not going to save your life, No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not quite the same. Yeah, it's a but, cut if you're really cold. <laughs> that's yeah. right. I'm so cold. <laughs> um, no, I really like the GLC. It, yeah, it's yeah, a it's very, very nice, very likable car. car. It yes. is. Um, it, it, it's so much to the point that it's something I'm considering buying at some point. It tows a little more than a lot of these crossovers. It's a really nice size. It's easy to see out mm -hmm. of. It's a very pleasant car. Yep. It's just $49,000. It's because it's a Mercedes Benz. Sure. Uh, let's help people buy some cars. Sure. Uh, can anyone recommend a good new full size sports sedan around or under 50,000 bucks? I'm interested in anything but Lexus. I feel like I'm now stuck between entry level luxury sedans and compact sports sedans with that with 50 grand. When all I really want is something similar to an Audi S6 or RS6 or CS55 or 63, those are the Mercedes if it wasn't so hideous looking. But those are way above my price range. I want decent performance, sporty handling and ride with a spacious interior. I'm six foot three and would still like someone to fit behind me in the back seat if necessary. There's only one solution for well, you. Well, modest, modest, modest ask. <laughs> Was that written from the Chevrolet SS uh, forum? Fan yeah, forum? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, that, yeah. yeah. So that's because that, that is the answer to that question. The right. Chevrolet SS. Correct. Yeah. yeah, we're done. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> I mean, there are there are other options. Uh, there are Dodge Charger. Yeah, there's uh, versions of the, the Dodge Hemi. Charger with. Yeah. Sure, you're like, not going to get a Hellcat for fifty thousand bucks, but you, you are. You can get, get a whole a, lot of horsepower. Yeah. You can get a ton of horsepower. But yeah, I think the SS is. Probably, I mean, it's certainly my favorite. I mean, it just it drives so nice. Mm -hmm. um, it just fits like a glove to that description. Yeah, it, it's a it's, yeah. it's a Corvette in a full size car body. Uh, the only other car I would that I thought of with this, although it's not so overtly sporty, is the the um, Hyundai Genesis. I mean, that is a pretty good driving car. It has a very luxurious interior. Uh, yeah, but a lot it's of a space. Different, different animal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's more of an Audi A6 rather than the S6 or an RS6. It, it's I have a hard time calling it a sports sedan. Yeah. It's a great luxury vehicle, yeah. but, but sports sedan is, yeah. Yep, so we have now just doubled Chevy SS sales. Because, <laughs> because, Two this year. Because it's a great car that no <clears throat> one buys. Uh, next question. Okay, I have a 2004 Volvo S80 with 158,000 miles. My son is going to start driving in May. I know the Volvo was really safe. For 1999, is it worth buying a newer? Because that's when the car came out. Is it worth buying a newer car for him with all the driving assistance aids? Yes. Oh, 
Or you're not done, sorry. <laughs> I'm almost <laughs> done. Uh, if it were to be a newer car, I'm thinking 2016 Subaru Impreza, 2016 Honda Civic Touring, or 2016 Mazda CX-3, please help. Now, I think the S80 would have stability, con might, well, it might have stability control. Um, yeah, Volvo was those tricky. were the years where Volvo was tricky about it. It was either STC for oh, stability yeah, control, DTS yeah, something for full it, unless, stability unless control. Unless it says DSTC on a button on the console, <clears> so it doesn't have full stability the, the, control. The point here, and this is a common question, a lot of people in the right. same boat, and, the, and here's the thing, even with stability control, when you're talking about a 10-year-old car or more, this car is not built around the same safety standards. I mean, even, even, even past the stability control, I mean, you look at offset crash tests. You look at you know uh, narrow offset. All these different things. The even car, side crash. Yes, was, uh, that yes. wasn't even a test back no, in '99. Right. Yeah, excellent point. So I mean, if you get into a new car, and and, and those are great choices that he brings up. But I would I also throw out like the Scion IA. I think it's another interesting choice that has standard low-speed uh, uh, automatic braking. Mm -hmm. um, these cars are built around new standards. These cars are safer. So don't get caught up in the fact that it's a Volvo name and it's got a lot of metal around you. When it really comes to you know surviving a crash, you want the latest It was stuff. designed two decades ago. And it was probably, right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's an eternity. And it was probably really good for two decades ago. Mm -hmm. But things have progressed. Right. I mean, there, there is still, <clears throat> mass still does play a role. But sure. vehicle design. Well, in, in some crashes. Right. But if you're going into a tree or if you're going into a, you know, getting side swaps, well, yeah. there's, there's other types of, right. Not every crash is a head head on head. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. That's when mass matters. I mean, of those three cars, the <clears throat> Impreza probably arguably is this. I mean, this, the Impreza has terrific crash test results. You mm -hmm. can get eyesight. Um, <clears throat> yep. You know, the Civic, the Honda Civic is also a very, you know, is also a very nice car. Mm -hmm. It might be harder to find the, uh, the safety stuff Yeah, on that. he was talking about getting a Civic Touring, which gets all the stuff standard, mm -hmm. although it's also a $26,000 car. So. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, some uh, questions about Detroit. Um, one of the um, people on the forum, who, or people on YouTube, who always, always is sure to mention when we say something bad about Honda, <coughs> he asks, no accurate precision concept? I wonder why. Why didn't we talk about the accurate precision <coughs> concept? Well, it was a concept car that doesn't mean a whole lot to a whole lot of people, but it, what it does mean is that it's a Acura's own admission that their current uh, lineup of sedans is quite lame, and hopefully <laughs> that uh, is a reset button for uh, Acura that, okay, we, we've been pretty boring and pretty lame, and now we, we've got the message and, you know, maybe hope for the future. Mercedes-Benz is yeah, angry. The Mercedes-Benz like, Mercedes we making. Yeah, exactly. Tom was driving in the Mercedes. <laughs> yeah, just making all sorts of noises and groans. Um, all right, back to Acura. Back so, to Acura. I mean, look, we didn't talk a lot about it because, I mean, we really concentrate a lot of our, uh, about real cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're, we're covering that. Production cars. Production cars. And this Acura was kind of a design direction. Not unimportant. And, and Gabe's totally right. I mean, look, you look at most Acuras today, I mean, they look like Hondas with braces on, right? I mean, right. that's, you know, it's got the, the retainer and... And, and look, that the new concept looks good. So, I mean, I think that would be a really good move for Acura. It looks like a Mazda 6 with a few more creases in it. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, again, it was a styling concept that showed off a new infotainment idea. It was really pretty much it's, it's an very, admission. It, like Gabe said, it was an admission we need to make the cars more exciting. And it's actually very similar to what Buick was doing at the show, too, right? This is the second year in a row that they showed some great concept that looked great. They're not producing anything, but they're, they're, they're playing with, with styling, and I think that would help Buick a lot, too. We're talking about the new Chrysler minivan, which they renamed Pacifica mm. from Town and Country. Uh, one right. of, first of all, about the name. Someone else kind of mentioned the name change. <clears throat> Elton John says, Chrysler, over its history, has used a Pacifica name several times. None has been a sales success. Caravan might have baggage, but at least you knew what it was getting, and you were getting 30 years of history. The big point I had is, like I said, I came from a Chrysler minivan family. We loved those cars. And to us, a town and country was always something to aspire to. I mean, back in the late 80s when it had the wood grain on the sides and the wire wheels and the tufted leather, boy, life would have been good if we could have afforded a town and country. <laughs> Learned a lot about you today. Yeah. <laughs> mm, wire wheels. <coughs> uh, so, I mean, yeah, to, to, to lose town and country to Pacifica, which was a very mediocre crossover that sold okay, but I don't think anyone was pining for the return of, of Pacifica. Does that mean Ford should bring back the country squire as well? Uh, my, uh, my, um, my fond memories only go back so far. They don't go back to Country Squire. Uh, about Fiat Chrysler products, it's, n look, our reliability data for them is just 
it's really bad. The, the mm -hmm. cars have not been reliable, and their newer designs have not. They just well, let's make a impressive. distinction here. I think uh, their uh, platforms uh, for the, the Charger, the Challenger, the 300, Durango, and, and Grand Robo, Cherokee. Grand Cherokee, those are all pretty solid and, and good. I mean, it's the, the newer platforms that are based on Fiat designs with a nine speed automatic that are really troublesome. Right, but even so, there's, there's still problems with 300 and, and Charger and right. um, Grand Cherokee. I mean, I own, as Gabe referred to only, I, I own a, earlier, I own a Dodge Durango. I like it very much. Right now it's at the dealer because there's a check engine light that they can't figure out. So I mean, you know, yeah, they make some really nice cars, but they just... Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's worthwhile, uh, you know, taking those two pieces. And no, yeah, separate my it. personal history right. to what our readers right. service I mean, say. there are many FCA vehicles that we enjoy. Mm -hmm. We like them. We like driving around. It's what our subscribers are telling us about how much these things break down that really is kind of the nail in the coffin when we're coming to recommending these vehicles. It's not our judgment that our, I don't care that you're, we don't care no, that your no, car's in the dealership. No, it's that a, doesn't it's matter. A single it's data the fact point. that there are hundreds or probably thousands of people who have that vehicle are telling us about it and telling us what goes wrong with it. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking to. I mean, it's, exactly. al it's also that since the merger, like you said, they've done a lot of, the, the new cars that they've introduced have all been based off of Fiat platforms that have been less than optimal. Mm -hmm. uh, they just, you know, and that's what, you referred to this earlier, that's what make this, makes the Pacifica a very interesting car, is that this is clean sheet. Right. What can this company do, given nothing, nothing much carrying over? Yep. Well, it'll be interesting to see. It will be very interesting to see. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of Talking Cars. As always, we thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks.